Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Rogue Theater. It's always a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for, for coming and exploring Virginia Woolf with me. Um, I want to thank especially Paul Winnick and Rhonda Lussman for sponsoring this talk. As well as the Arizona Humanities Council. So thank you, Arizona Humanities Council. I want to thank Jerry James for his essay about the Bloomsbury Group. Where are you? <laughs> now, in 1939, Virginia Woolf wrote, Every day includes more non-being than being. As a child then, my days, just as they do now, contained a large proportion of this cotton wool this non-being. Then, for no reason that I know about, there was a revelation of some order, a token of some real thing behind appearances. And I make it real by putting it into words. The title of this talk today is Moments of Being. Virginia Woolf creates, in Mrs. Dalloway, in all of her writings, moments of being. Those moments when the cotton wool of everyday life parts and we see the truth behind appearances. Many of us know a few things about Virginia Woolf. Uh, many of us know that she was part of the influential Blue Bloomsbury group of intellectuals, especially if you got here early and already read Jerry's <laughs> essay. <laughs> many of us probably know that she wrote A Room of One's Own, a treatise on the importance of independence for women writers, although it's a lot more than that yeah. as well. Many of us probably know that she had a love affair with a woman named Vita Sackville West while she was married, while Virginia was married to Leonard Wolf. And most of us probably know that she died by suicide. Mm -hmm. There's actually a lot the world knows about Virginia Woolf since she maintained a diary for most of her adult life, which now comprises a five-volume set of over 2,000 pages. And because of her status and popularity among artists and intellectuals of her time, she was frequently painted and photographed. And there have been dozens and dozens and dozens, and actually Jerry just brought me five more books that I don't, I don't own. There have been dozens and dozens of books written about Virginia Woolf especially since the women's movement of the 1960s and 70s. Virginia Stephen Wolf was born in 1882, the third child of Sir Leslie Stephen and Julia Duckworth Stephen. Her father, Leslie Stephen, was a notable historian, author, critic, and mountaineer. Her mother, Julia Stephen, was a renowned beauty born in British India, who sat as a model for pre-Raphaelite painters. The family lived at 22 Hyde Park Gate, Kensington. The children were raised in an environment filled with the influences of Victorian literary society. In 1904, when Virginia Woolf was 21, her father, Leslie Stephen, died, and the family moved to the more bohemian Bloomsbury where Virginia bro Virginia's brother, Toby, founded the Bloomsbury Group. He died shortly thereafter of ty typhoid. Mm -hmm. Both of these deaths, when Virginia Woolf was a very young woman, affected her profoundly. After her father's death, she had a long period of debilitating depression, which was compounded by her brother's death. Now, as Jerry's essay describes, between the world wars, Wolf was a central figure in the influential Bloomsbury group of intellectuals, which included her brothers as well as her sister, Vanessa Bell, who was an artist and illustrated the covers of most of Virginia Woolf's books, most of her novels. Uh, the group also included Vanessa's husband, Clive Bell, who was an art critic. E.M. Forster was also a part of that group, and he was the author of A Passage to India. And Lytton Strachey, author of Imminent Victorians, was 
a part of the group, as well as the painter Roger Fry. What's notable about all these members of the Bloomsbury group is that they gathered together every Thursday evening for drinks and conversation for years before they were famous. Uh, it's fun to imagine what those evenings were like. The ideas, the conversations. There's a line in Mrs. Dalloway in which Peter describes a conversation with Clarissa saying, we went in and out of each other's minds without any effort. I imagine that's what the, the Bloomsbury group was like. Virginia married Leonard Wolf in 1912, and together they founded Hogarth Press. The press not only published Wolf's writings, but it also published other writers, including the first editions of the poetry of T.S. Eliot. Wolf and T.S. Eliot were great friends. Hogarth Press also famously turned down the publishing of James Joyce's Ulysses. <laughs> Wolf's most famous works include Mrs. Dalloway in 1925, To the Lighthouse, 1927, Orlando, 1928, A Room of One's Own, 1929, with its famous dictum, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. <laughs> and she also wrote The Waves in 1931. She also wrote dozens of short stories, literary reviews and articles, as well as her final book, which was a biography of the artist Roger, uh, Roger Fry. Now, Wolf experimented with stream of consciousness, as well as the underlying psychological and emotional motives of characters. She suffered from severe bouts with mental illness throughout her life, thought to have been the result of what we would now call bipolar disorder. She died by suicide by filling her overcoat pockets with stones and walking into the River Ose in 1941 at the age of 59. I think we are often captivated by the story of Virginia Woolf's life, uh, the drama of her death, her sexual explorations, the famous circle in which she moved. But it's her writing that I find truly remarkable. She is now recognized as one of the foremost <coughs> modernists of the 20th century. So let's talk a little bit about modernism. Modernist writers proclaimed a new subject matter for literature, and they felt that their new way of looking at life required a new form. Writers of this period tended to pursue more ex experimental and highly individualistic forms of writing. The sense of a changing world was stimulated by radical new developments in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Some of these new developments included the emerging fields of psychology and sociology, anthropological studies of comparative religions around the world, theories of electromagnetism and quantum physics, a growing critique of British imperialism and the ide ideology of empire, the escalation of warfare to a global level, shifting power structures, particularly as women entered the workforce, the emergence of a new city consciousness as more people move to cities, and new technologies such as radio and cinema. All these new fields of study and discoveries fueled the artists of this generation. Now, who were um, some of the modernists? Well, the painters, um, will, you'll recognize many of these names, Manet, Seurat, Picasso, Matisse, the poets, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, William Carlos Williams, H.D. or Hilda Doolittle, the novelists, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, William Faulkner, Marcel Proust, and in music, Arnold Schoenberg's rejection of tonality and Igor Stravinsky's move away from metrical rhythm are just a few of the modernist musicians. <coughs> Now, some of the new approaches or manifestations of this new approach in modernist writing can be found in four of the major elements of narrative writing. Character, plot, style, and point of view. Character. 
there was a disappearance of discrete, well-demarcated characters. The representation of the self became diverse, contradictory, ambiguous, multiple. This is on full display in Mrs. Dalloway. Many of the dozens of characters in Mrs. Dalloway are mere sketches or outlines. Some of them are only textures, really. And the major characters in the novel, such as Mrs. Dalloway, are contradictory. Is she a snob? Is she a compassionate person? There are no clear heroes and villains in Mrs. Dalloway. All of the characters are a complex blend of good and evil, pettiness and grandeur. Plot. Now, there was a skepticism among the modernists about linear plots with sudden climactic turning points and clear resolutions. Modernist writers used instead discontinuous fragments, uh, achronological leaps in time, contrapuntal multiple plots, and open, unresolved endings. There are no happily ever afters in modernist writing. There is very little in the way of plot in Mrs. Dalloway. It's certainly not a page turner. <laughs> achronological leaps in time happen several times per page. And here, there is no happy ending, or for that matter, unhappy ending. <laughs> like life, the story continues. As for style, one of the most unique innovations of the modernists was the use of stream of consciousness, which traces nonlinear thought processes. This is, of course, much the same way that we think. Since you entered the doors of the Rogue today, your mind has traveled much farther than the few yards it took you to come into the theater. <laughs> you may have remembered the last play you saw here. You may be thinking about the last conversation you had with your daughter. You may remember the cookies your mother used to bake 60 years ago. Our minds travel a tremendous distance in a short period of time. And this stream of consciousness style of writing is imagistic rather than logistical. In other words, uh, or rather than logical, it, it, is, it is comprised of images rather than a logical progression of ideas. Although Mrs. Dalloway takes place in a single day in London, the characters' minds traverse over 30 years and dozens of locations. And the progression through the novel and through our play is more like moving from image to image rather than from event to event. <coughs> Finally, regarding point of view, the modernists rejected the single authoritative omniscient point of view in favor of a narrative focused through the consciousness of one character whose point of view is limited. There's, there's never that omniscient narrator that we think of in, in many works of fiction. Or the narrative it comes through several characters who establish mul multiple relative points of view. In Virginia Woolf's last novel, The Waves, perhaps her most experimental work, the narrative is told from six different characters' points of view. All of these modernist techniques are on full display in Mrs. Dalloway. And the modernist movement continues to influence writers today. Joe McGrath, who's been reading a book of short stories by Karen Blick, also known as Isaac Dinesen, in preparation for Babette's Feast next season, mentioned that Blick writes as though modernism never happened. And of course, many writers continue to use traditional narrative structures and character development. But modernism has influenced us in, the, in ways that we may not realize. The use of flashbacks, for instance, in fiction or in drama or in films. A standard literary practice now is a result of the modernist movement. In television dramas, the use of multiple plot lines might also be viewed as a modernist development. So, what is Mrs. Dalloway about? <laughs> well, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> The writer Deborah Eisenberg describes Mrs. Dalloway in this way. 
A rather unremarkable woman spends the day preparing for the party she is to give that evening. Two old friends arrive unexpectedly in time for the party. At the party, the hostess happens to learn that a stranger has committed suicide during the course of the day. An unpromising set of suppositions for a novel, you might think, if that's the way Mrs. Dalloway was described to you. You might expect something random, mundane, static, or else bloated and heavy with melodrama. But what you would actually find, if you were to read it anyway, is something aerial, alive with motion and free of melodrama, a marvel of tensile strength. I love that, something aerial, alive with motion. In her diary, Virginia Woolf herself described Mrs. Dalloway as she was writing it in 1923. She wrote, but now what do I feel about my writing? This book that is The Hours, if that's its name. For many months while Woolf was writing it, the title of Mrs. Dalloway was The Hours. One must write from deep feeling, said Dostoevsky. And do I? Or do I fabricate with words, loving them as I do? No, I think not. In this book, I have almost too many ideas. I want to give life and death, sanity and insanity. I want to criticize the social system and to show it at work, at its most intense. Life and death, sanity and insanity, the social system at work. All of these are themes in Mrs. Dalloway. Another interpretation of what is Mrs. Dalloway about comes from Francine Prose, the editor of the Mrs. Dalloway Reader. She writes, ask any writer of serious fiction why they write, what continues to engage them, and nearly all of them will tell you what interests them. The reason why one becomes that sort of a writer in the first place is consciousness human awareness, the mind and soul of one's characters. It's why most writers cringe when even the most favorable reviews doggedly recount the plot or focus on some abstract thing that has nothing to do with whatever sparked the author's initial interest. And this is also part of what makes Mrs. Dalloway so successful and so impressive. The fact that Virginia Woolf somehow managed to write a novel about consciousness in such a way that it is virtually impossible to mistake her intention. Consciousness is at the core of Mrs. Dalloway. Human consciousness, stream of consciousness. The way our minds follow various paths throughout our days, mixing the past and the future, and settling for a few brief moments of being each day. If you were to ask me, what Mrs. Dalloway is about, I would say that it is a meditation on life and death, on sanity, on growing old, on love, and yes, on consciousness. Mrs. Dalloway was originally titled The Hours in its early drafts. Throughout the novel and our play, the hours of the day are noted by Big Ben's chimes. It's described in the novel in this way. First the warning, musical, then the hour, irrevocable. In 1998, Michael Cunningham wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Hours, which is a kind of remix of Mrs. Dalloway and was made into a wonderful 2002 film by the same name featuring, featuring Meryl Streep, Juliana Moore, and Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman plays Virginia Woolf in the film. Not only were the book and the movie of the hours great successes, but they created another renaissance of Mrs. Dalloway, the original novel. Author, author Michael Cunningham tells us that almost as many copies of Mrs. Dalloway were sold as his novel was during the year he won the Pulitzer Prize. Now here to read a short piece by Michael Cunningham called First Love is Christopher Johnson. Mrs. Dalloway is the first great book I ever read. I was 15, a not very promising student at a not very good public high school in Southern California, 
where I read the books that I was made to read, but thought of literature as a dying art form. <laughs> One day I was out having a cigarette where we went to have cigarettes, and suddenly found myself standing beside the pirate queen of our school. She was beautiful and mean and smart. She had long red fingernails and long straight hair, fringe pretty much everywhere. I found myself standing next to her and I thought, uh-oh. Be fast, think fast, be suave, say something that will make her love you forever. <laughs> So I said something that I thought then, and I think today, was very winning about the poetry of Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen. She was kind to me. She sucked in her entire Marlboro in one drag, the ash didn't fall, and exhaled an immense cloud of smoke and said, well, yes, they're very good, but how do you feel about T.S. Eliot and Virginia Woolf? Now, I wasn't completely illiterate. I had heard of T.S. Eliot and Virginia Woolf, and I knew Virginia Woolf was very tall and insane and lived in a lighthouse and jumped in the ocean. <laughs> but I never expected I'd have to read either one of them. I went to the library, uh, the bookmobile, the little trailer where the books were. They didn't have any Eliot, but they did have one book of Woolf's, and it was Mrs. Dalloway. I took it out. And I took it home and read it, tried to read it, and I didn't know what was going on. In another way, I did get it. I did get the depth and density and the sentences, and it did turn on some little light inside my stupid skull. Everybody who reads has a first book. Maybe not the first book you read, but the first book that shows you what literature can be, like a first kiss. And you read other books, you kiss other people, but especially for those who are romantically inclined, that first book stays with you. I felt wedded to Mrs. Dalloway in a way I've never felt about any other book. I finally, finally grew up and wrote The Hours, in which I tried to take an existing work of great art and make another work of art out of it, the way a jazz musician might play improvisations on a great piece of music. I learned so much from Wolf as a writer. I think what I learned most importantly was her conviction that the whole of human existence, while it is copiously contained in foreign wars and the death of kings and the other big subjects for big novels, is also contained in every hour in the life of everybody. Very much the same way the blueprint for the whole organism is contained in every strand of its DNA. If you look with sufficient penetration and sufficient art at any hour in the life of anybody, you can crack it open and get everything. Virginia Woolf understood that every character, no matter how minor, in a novel she wrote was visiting the novel from a novel of his or her own where he or she was the hero of another great and tragic and comic tale. Oh, thank you, Christopher. I love that story. Uh, I love the idea of the DNA in, in literature. It's wonderful. Um, Christopher, by the way, is playing um, Septimus Warren Smith, one of the major characters in our production of uh, Mrs. Dalloway. Great. <laughs> now let's talk about the major characters and their threads through Mrs. Dalloway. Because Wolf's characters are integral to her, her exploration of human consciousness. In her diary, diary in 1922, Virginia Woolf wrote, I dig out beautiful caves behind my characters. Caves of humanity, humor, and depth. The idea is that the caves shall connect, and each comes to daylight at the present moment. One has a sense in Mrs. Dalloway of the interconnectedness of characters. Clarissa Dalloway happens to see an open book in a shop window. The book is Shakespeare's play, Symboli. It's a song sung at a funeral in the play, Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. 
It's a beautiful thought that in death, one is no longer subject to the vague vagaries of weather or of life. Clarissa repeats this line throughout the novel, fear no more the heat of the sun. And then later in the novel, Septimus Warren Smith picks up the phrase. We immediately connect the two characters through this line, and this is just one of the ways that they are connected. Now, Mrs. Clarissa Dalloway is the main character of the novel, a 50-something-year-old woman living in Westminster, married to a member of Parliament. At the novel's beginning, she has recently recovered from the Spanish flu. The pandemic of 1918, which killed an estimated 20, 228,000 people in the United Kingdom alone, made 1918 the first year on record in which deaths exceeded births in the UK. The character of Clarissa Dalloway was based on a childhood friend of Virginia Woolf's, Kitty Max, who became the kind of society woman Woolf was raised to be, that is, the proper genteel wife of a prominent man. In 1922, right as Woolf was starting Mrs. Dalloway, Kitty Max died by falling over a staircase banister. Woolf speculated on whether the accident was purposeful or not. The novel follows Clarissa through a single day in June 1923, a day in which she is giving a party. Nothing terribly remarkable happens to Clarissa on that day. She shops for flowers, she mends her dress, she meets an old friend, her husband brings her roses. But Clarissa's day is full of memories and wonderings about what might have been. In the end, she comes to terms with what her life is now. Peter Walsh is another major character in the novel. He was in love with Clarissa when they were young, and he has lived a rather unsuccessful life since then. He fell in love with a woman on a boat to India, where he lived for many years in, in India, not on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> that marriage ended in divorce, and on this day in 1923, Peter returns to London to see about getting a divorce for another woman whom he intends to marry. He's also looking for a job, but he stops by to see Clarissa on the day of her party and then walks about London musing on the changes in the city and considering what he has done with his life. Septimus Warren Smith is the third major character in the novel, a returning soldier from World War I who suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder or shell shock as it's described in the novel. In addition to the Spanish flu, which claimed hundreds of thousands of lives in England, World War I claimed another 744,000 lives of UK citizens between 1914 and 1918. Septimus, in the novel, was one of those who survived. In battle, he watched as his friend and commanding officer Evans was killed. Back in London, he now hears voices and sees disturbing images, and has lost his ability to feel. While he was still in Italy, he married a young Italian woman, Lucrezia. He brings her back to London with him. Clarissa Dalloway and Septimus Ward Smith never meet in the novel. But when Clarissa hears about his death, she is deeply moved and feels a deep connection to him. As with every other character in the novel, one can hear Virginia Woolf's own life reflected in Septimus, especially in his relationship with doctors and his consideration of suicide. There are several other significant characters in the novel and our play. They include Richard Dalloway, Clarissa's husband, who is a member of Parliament, Sally Seton, Clarissa's wild girlhood friend, who exists mostly in memory, although she comes to Clarissa's party at the end of the day, in many ways, she is a reflection of Wolf's lover, Vita Sackville West. Hugh Whitbread, another girlhood friend of Clarissa's, Hugh in many ways represents British society and its foibles. Lucrezia Warren Smith is Septimus's Italian wife and a hat maker who was caught in her own tragedy following the war. Elizabeth Dalloway is Clarissa and Richard's daughter. She is significant as a representation of the possibilities for young women in the 1920s. The novel includes dozens of other characters, many of whom only appear for a moment, 
but all of them are extensions of Virginia Woolf, either directly or indirectly. For example, I'm certain the doctors who tend to Septimus in the novel are reflections of Woolf's own doctors as she struggled with her own mental challenges. So, why adapt Mrs. Dalloway into a play, and how does one go about it? I fell in love with Virginia Woolf's writing over 40 years ago when I was an undergraduate at Eastern, Mich Eastern Michigan University. A professor suggested I read Woolf's short stories, and I was completely captivated. I was captivated by her imagery, her wit, and her understanding of the way the mind worked. My love of Woolf's writing has only increased over the years. In fact, seven years ago, The Rogue performed another adaptation of mine called The Lady in the Looking Glass, featuring several Virginia Woolf short stories. And in 2009, we produced Sarah Rule's adaptation of Orlando, Virginia Woolf's novel and love letter to Vita Sapko West. So when I heard over a year ago that Mrs. Dalloway had entered public domain, I knew I wanted to try and create an adaptation for the Rogue stage. If you've come to the Rogue at all, and you all have, you will know that we love staging great literature, sometimes in the form of great plays, but often in the form of great novels and short stories. We feel that beautiful language that is worth reading silently is worth being heard aloud. In fact, the creative possibilities of staging in the theater can make narrative fiction come alive like no other medium can. We're always asked to use our imaginations when we come to the theater, so why not create the world of a novel on stage and use our imaginations to complete the picture? So how does one go about adapting a novel, especially a novel like Mrs. Dalloway? Well, Mrs. Dalloway contains very little dialogue. Generally speaking, most plays are based entirely in dialogue. <laughs> but most of the text of Mrs. Dalloway is narrative. So I made the decision to turn most of the narrative into first person, shared by several individuals, each describing their thoughts, actions, and memories from their point of view. I began with the entire novel on my computer and sculpted the story, eliminating those sections, lines, and words that seemed furthest from the core of the story. I chose to emphasize certain themes suggested by Wolfe, life and death, sanity and insanity, the British social system at work. I was struck by the frequency of memory, the importance of love, the fallibility of characters throughout the novel. I was also fascinated by the frequent references to the interconnectedness of being. Characters are described as being connected by a spider's thread to one another. Cl uh, Clarissa throws her party so that she can introduce people to one another. Peter Walsh recalls what he describes as Clarissa's transcendental theory in which she believes that our, appar our apparitions the part of us which appears are so momentary compared with the unseen part of us, which spreads wide. The unseen might survive attached to another person or even haunting certain places after death. I found this idea fascinating and so kept most of the writing which dealt with this interconnectedness. I also wanted to maintain as much of the poetry of Wolf's writing as I possibly could. The script is 98% completely Wolf's words. I invented very little. Last summer, a group of actors read a first draft of the script from which I took copious notes. I cut, condensed, reimagined. I then frequently read the script aloud so I could hear how it sounded and how the words might live aloud in space and time. I then made changes, cuts, and additions up until we began rehearsal six weeks ago, after which I made more changes in concert with the company of actors. In many ways, the cast of Mrs. Dalloway are co-creators of the adaptation, and without their creativity and insight, the play would be something much less. I chose to cast 12 people in the production, six men, six women. Together, they play over 60 characters. My goal was always to render Wolf's rich language, thoughts, and characters 
into a three-dimensional evening of theater. One of the devices I developed in the adaptation was the practice of using inner characters, additional characters who voice what the major characters are feeling and thinking. So in the play, there are inner Clarissas, inner Peters, inner Septimuses, etc. To illustrate this, we'd like to share with you a scene from the play. In the scene, Clarissa is at home, mending her dress for the party, when Peter Walsh, whom she hasn't seen in years, appears. But in the adaptation, we have four actors on stage. We have Clarissa and Peter, but we also have inner Clarissa and inner Peter. The inner characters say what is left unsaid as they voice the inner thoughts of Clarissa and Peter. I'd like to welcome to the stage Cynthia Jeffrey, Joe McGrath, Terry Lee Thomas, and Michael Levin. So, on a summer's day, waves collect and fall, collect and fall, and the whole world seems to be saying, that is all. Fear no more. Heavens, the doorbell. Mr. Dalloway will Who see can me. That be? Oh, oh, yes, she will see me. After five years in India, Clarissa will see me. And how are you? She's grown older. Exactly the same. A little thinner, drier perhaps, but he looks awfully well and just the same. How happy it is to see you again. Oh, that's so like him. Uh, I only reached out last night. How is everything? How is everybody? Uh, Richard? Elizabeth? And what's all this? Here she's been sitting all the time you've been in India, mending her dress, going to parties with her husband, the admirable Richard. Richard is quite well. He's at some committee. Do you mind me finishing the sewing on my dress? We have a party tonight, which I shan't invite you to, my dear Peter. It is delicious <laughs> to hear her say that, my dear Peter. Why won't you invite me to your party? Now, of course, he's enchanting. Why did you make up your mind not to marry him that awful summer? But it's so extraordinary that, that you should come this morning. Do you remember how the blinds used to flap at Fortune? They did. You remember breakfasting alone very awkwardly with her father? I often wish I'd got on better with your father. Oh, but he never liked anyone who uh, I mean our friends. She could have bitten her tongue for reminding Peter that he had wanted to marry her. Of course you wanted to marry her. It almost broke your heart, too. His grief rose like a moon looked at from the terrace. She seemed to be sitting with him on the terrace, in the moonlight. I never go there now. But why go back like this to the past? Why make him think of it again? Why make him suffer? Do you remember the lake? Yes, I, I remember the lake. Yes, Stop. yes, yes. Stop! He is not old. His life is not over. Not by any means. Will you tell her? Make a clean breast of it all? But she is too cold. Daisy would look ordinary beside Clarissa. And she would think you a failure. You are a failure compared with all this. The inlaid table, the candlesticks, the chair covers. You are a failure. What an extraordinary habit that was. Always playing with a knife. Always making one feel frivolous. A mere chatterbox. And so, what's happened to you? Millions of things. I am in love. In love. In love with a girl in India. In love? Wow. At his age that he should be sucked under by that monster. <laughs> he is in love, not with you, with some younger woman, of course. And uh, who is she? A married woman, of course. <laughs> the, uh, the wife of a major in the Indian Army. She has two small children, a boy and a girl, and I've come over to see my lawyers about the divorce. Do what you like with it, Clarissa. There it is. <laughs> No one understands you as Clarissa does. 
Your exquisite intimacy. What a waste. What a folly. All his life, Peter has been fooled like that. First getting sent down from Oxford. Next, marrying the woman he met on the boat going to India. And now, in love with the wife of a major in the Indian army. Thank heaven you refused to marry him. Still, oh, he is in love. Your old friend, your dear Peter, he is in love. What are you going to do? The lawyers and solicitors are going to do it. For heaven's sake, would you put your knife away? It's his silly unconventionality that annoys you, has always annoyed you, and now at his age, how silly. He knows all that. You know what I'm up against? You and Galloway and, and all the rest. But I'll show you. I'll... You still have the power to make the moon rise on the terrace in the summer sky. Thank you. <laughs> I encourage you, when you come to see Mrs. Dalloway, not to expect a traditional play. <laughs> Some of you may even decide that it's not a play at all. I might agree with you. <laughs> it's a rendering of Mrs. Dalloway with music, human bodies, characters, theatrical device, and gorgeous language. So we have a few minutes if you have any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. You said that it became public domain. How long does it take for a work of art to become public domain for you to I think it's nine. Uh, Paul, I'm going to look at you here. It's nine. Life of the author plus seventy years. Death of the author plus seventy years. Mm -hmm. right. Other thoughts? Yes. Uh, so you mentioned the context of the Spanish flu. Um, I'm wondering, what do you think about the relevance of Virginia Woolf for at this moment that we're living in now, the uh, hopefully emergence of the pandemic? Yeah. One of the things that's, you know, when I read those statistics about the Spanish flu and about um, the World War I, it's no wonder that death was on people's minds in the early 1920s. Um, I think it also gave rise to the roaring 20s, you know, that we're still alive, let's, let's live as if there's no tomorrow. Um, and I, you know, us just emerging from the pandemic and so very conscious of the war in UK, Ukraine right now, mm -hmm. that there may there may be something that we can relate to in in that regard. Um, I think it's a it's, but you know I'm kind of a nerd. Um, I think it's a, a fascinating book anytime, but there certainly are reverberations for right now. Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to ask you how do you make a book into a play, and we've already answered that. Okay. But this is your creation, and I'm just curious, do you anticipate, as you watch this play emerge, do you anticipate that your creative process will continue with this, that you'll continue to make changes and, and revisions? I'm just... Um, prob I'm just probably, if the, if the actors let me. <laughs> <laughs> Just last night, we cut a couple of lines that I felt like we didn't need. Um, so tonight, we'll be doing, you know, a slightly different version of, of, of a couple parts of the play. So, yeah, there there are probably going to be constant little touches. Um, but but that actually happens with lots of plays, not in terms of uh, cutting lines or adding lines, but in terms of a director stepping in and saying, hey, can we tweak that moment? Can we change that moment a little bit? And giving actors notes. We do that here at The Rogue all the time. Yeah? Can you copyright the adaptation? 
Can I copy? <laughs> Paul, I'm so glad you're here today. Can I copyright the adaptation? Um, <laughs> you can copyright, no, you can't copyright her words in, right. in her structure, but right. additions to it you could? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And perhaps if it were reorganized, things like that. Yeah. Often, it's not an easy question at all. Often people ask us, you know, if the, if whenever we do a, a brand new play here or a brand new adaptation, you know, if we're going to try and market it to other places and so on. And we never do. Yeah. We do these plays for you. We do them um, as artists here in Tucson for Tucson audiences. And so we're not, we're not interested in it really going anywhere else. We just want to do it for you. Yeah. Yeah. One of Virginia Woolf's <coughs> writings should I need to introduce myself to her. One of my favorite short stories of hers, and I think it's available online, is The New Dress. It's um, very accessible. It's, um, it's, it's about a, a woman who comes to a party at Clarissa Dalloway's house. Clarissa Dalloway was a character used in, in lots of Virginia Woolf's short stories before she wrote Mrs. Dalloway, but it's a character um, who decides to wear a new dress to the party and then feels like it's been an absolute flop. Um, but it's a, it's a beautiful piece of writing and it's really accessible. Her short, her short stories are really lovely. Yeah. Well, thank you all so very much.